Let me introduce the next part of a conversation like this because it's also from that uh, MPC uh, briefing. Now, commercial banks in the country are wary of the stigma and general outlook associated with borrowing from the discount window, often seen as an indicator that the bank is in a desperate position for liquidity. They further indicate that getting access to the funds publicly is also another indicator that the bank cannot access a factor that is normally viewed negatively by investors and customers. They're now asking for the Central Bank of Kenya CPK to lend them money cheaply and discreetly. Wow, in capital letters. In a credit survey report by the Central Bank of Kenya, the banks had processed um, had, to, had proposed to access money through its discount window, stating that the respondents, that's the banks, made proposals for the CBK to consider for further mitigation or the impact of the COVID-19. In summary, the banks have noted that there is need for CBK in conjunction with the National Treasury to come up with other specific measures that particularly cushion institutions. Currently, banks that tap the fund are required to file daily and weekly reports as well as put under targeted inspection from the regulator. Question being, could this be the reason behind data that now indicates that only a few banks have continued to rely on the regulator for the cash to stay afloat? Just before we jump to Abraham Udagod this morning, let's jump to that comment or quote by the CPK governor, Dr. Patrick Njoroge, on the stability of the banking industry in the country as we know of it in 2021. All right, Abraham and George, I want you to first react to this before then we talk about the financial stability of the banking industry in the country. He says that assuming, well, things don't get proper in the next three months, assuming we don't recover in quarter four, because we're still waiting for those numbers, that MPLs will just rise to 14% from 14 sorry to 16 or 17 percent he continues to say bodo because i want you to pick that first that the worst case scenario is that banks have been doing what they are supposed to do provision for false loans according to him everything is just fine we're doing okay bodo react but no i think yes, that's a statement good. that is supposed to uh, it's a statement that is supposed to convey um, everything is all right, but in actual sense, I don't think everything is right. But first of all, let's ask ourselves, yes. what's a restructured loan? 
right? Um, a restructured loan is a loan that is sitting in purgatory, right? It's, it's, it's the reason why you're structuring that loan is that the customer has not been paying for the last couple of months. Yes. Right? Yes. Um, and, and, and that's why you sit down with the customer and say, what's the problem? You know, can we give you more reprieve? Can we give you repayment holidays? Yes. The customer says yes. Right? So if you look at, for instance, um, what they're saying, uh, the, the figures of the Central Bank of Kenya, they are talking about 54% of loans have been captured by Q4 last year. That's very, very high, very high. Um, and, and, and almost uh, a third of that is, is household and personal loans, right? So it's talking about a recovery over the next three months. I think you need much more than that, right? <laughs> You're talking about people who lost their jobs, people who take, took 30, 40% pay cut, yes. right? And you're talking about uh, SMEs that either decided to cut down on the production or completely shut down. Yes. So there's no likelihood that they would come back in the next three months. There's no likelihood. There's no sign that someone will reopen their shop over the next three months. You yes. get back your 30, 40 percent pay cut over the next three months. So that's not possible. And, be, and, and aside from that, if you look at the credit, the, the credit survey report of the Central Bank of Kenya, it has some, it has some. Um, what I say. Um, contradictions, right? On the one side, the central bank insists that the, the banking sector is liquid, it's stable, right? But you have a very interesting um, um, conclusion to that report. Basically, the respondents are asking for further support, right? They're asking for credit guarantee schemes. They're asking for additional funding to be what offered to them at concessional rates. They're asking for the central bank to encourage them to use the discount window without the stigma. Yes. But there's a lot of stigma that comes with them with uh, using the discount window, yes. right? I mean, if I knew my bank is living on the discount window, <laughs> I would definitely know that there's a problem. <laughs> and I, I will go and remove my money. Yes. Because, yes. and even the central bank, it attracts some level of scrutiny. So what they're asking is, can those scrutinies be waived? Yes. Right? Yes. Can you not disclose our names to the public? which, of course, the, the central bank doesn't usually disclose who accesses the window. Yes. So there they're, they're covered. But also the central bank itself usually um, does a lot of inspection. That inspection um, creates some form of uh, uh, noise and attention, which is what they're asking not to be done. Yes. But the mere fact that they're asking for increased support, or liquidity support, it shows you there's a lot of stress. There's a lot of stress in the banking sector, which they're not bringing out. Pretty much. And I think I would have loved to see, yes. I, would have loved, I would have loved to see the central bank do what I call a stress test. Create more scenarios, say if NPLs went to 30%, which there's a probability. In my calculation, I think there are banks whose NPL ratios are almost 50% yes. in my calculation. Yes. Right? And, and, and even, especially the tier one bank, some of them are 30%. And the, the central bank should actually do a calculation and say, at 30%, at 40%, at, at 50%, how does the balance sheet look like? Pretty much. But there's something that you mentioned last year. I'm going to come back to that. You said that, well, let's not assume it's just 14%. Let's not assume it's 17%. I'm going to come back to that and ask you whether you still maintain the same same sentiment that you gave me last year, saying, well, these are the numbers that we have, but in reality, they could be more. All right, Abraham. I mean, he's saying everything is fine. But before you stand, do you share the same sentiment with Bodo that ah, uh, uh, it's not rousy as he's trying to paint uh, as he's trying to paint it? Uh, uh, you see, first and foremost, he's the governor of the Central Bank of Kenya. Yes, there is no way he can stand there and and, and proclaim doom on yes. the sector that he regulates. I, I think that would be wrong. <laughs> so he has to sit on the on, 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 on the best side of this scenario. Yes. Now we are here to analyze. So let's look at it as how bad it can get. Yes. We already admitted that at 14 percent is toxic. That one, there's no dispute. We've also agreed that 54% uh, has been res rescheduled. Remember, we've, we've said you, we, you can recalibrate, but you, you, you don't change what you're recalibrating. Okay? Yes. So the fact that you have rescheduled has not changed the quality of what you're rescheduling. Yes. All you have done is you have kicked the can down the lane. You have, you have delayed your pain. 
hoping that that pain will have gone away by the next time you, it comes around. Yes. It's like, you're snoo we're actually snoozing an alarm. It comes, we snooze it. We come, we snooze it. It will reach a point we, we can't snooze it anymore. Now, so we, we are saying, in effect, the worst case scenario is 14 plus 54. That is the worst case scenario. That all these scheduled, scheduled debts can go bad. That is what it is. That is, that is what we are looking at. That is the worst it can become using the statistics that have been admitted. Yes. yes. So if that is a reality, then, then we, it goes back to the issue of, he talked about provisioning. Yes, IFRS 9 has an element of performer provisioning. However, the models, with all banks use different models yes. for the IFRS 9 because IFRS 9 just gives guidelines but does not tell you that it is one method for... So every bank uses its own model of how they do their IFRS 9 yes. in terms of how they do their performer provisioning. And of course, they'll, every person, because provisioning hits your, your, your bottom line, they'll try to be as conservative as possible in terms of little, putting little provisions. Yes. But I don't think there's any bank that, 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 would, that would ride high when your provisioning starts hitting the 30, 40 mark. But yes. by the time you get to 50, you probably may not be solvent. So then what do we do? I think we are, we are staring at a very grim situation, and a, a situation whereby we can keep changing the goalposts, changing the ruler, in increasing the, increasing the w what we measure, and changing what is bad and what is not good. Yes. But the underlying asset can only be cured if the economy gets back where it's supposed to. He's talking about three, three months, I agree with Bodo, three months is, is, is too short a horizon. This economy, let's, let's talk about the whole of 2021 as a, horizon, as a time horizon of what we want to achieve. Yes. But in that 2021, how do we keep this sector afloat? Because all these things that have been floating in the air about the economic effects of this pandemic, will all of them are crystallizing now in the banks. Yes. So you'll start seeing the, the real stress. I mean, that's if this stress test, that's what I'm saying. For me, just have, one of the test tests I would do is what would 14 plus 54 percent look like? Pretty much. Yeah, which, because you compare that, the, 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 the 14 plus 54 of 3 trillion, which is, which is 68 percent of 3 trillion, how would it, how would it compare com to the total cap capital of all banks? How does it, how, how do those sit? And that's what we need to look at. Yes. And then break it down to individual banks. If that ratio is put to each bank vis-a-vis -vis their capital, how many would survive? And those are the things we start with that need to worry us. Then now, then now comes the other things, the, the, the problem of liquidity. What is happening? Even banks now have joined the list of pending bills because a loan will not paid is a pending bill. Yes. So even banks now are suffering the same problem. That's why there's liquidity because they, they, they gave out money, it's not come back. And the money they had, the deposits are taking it out. So, the, so, so the, the, there's a crunch. You see, so, so, so banks are experiencing the same problem People were experiencing last year that, that the, the money they gave out is not coming back. The money they had is being taken out. So the discount window is very critical. Yes, the stigma, we can talk about stigma, we can talk about everything. But it's about time we said the government is bailing out banks. But how do we bail them out? Then now we can have that conversation. Yes. Because once we agree that there's a problem, yes. then, we start, then we start the conversation of bailing. Because worldwide, the, the bailouts are... And bailouts... They not come in many ways. We're not saying that we give them free money. We're just sending them a very liquidity. And and even if the even if the government the money is not there, they are lines. Yes. We just pull them because we need to save our sector. Because this these statistics are not good. They, they are not good at all. And we are not out of the woods as you can see the corona, we are still in it. So what it will do to us economically is still an unknown. So what we need to do is to have measures that are sustainable to keep up. This rescheduling is good. At for you and I, that your, your debt, you, you've been able to push your can another six months. Yes. But for the bank, it's very, very painful for them. Because they, they, they have everybody doing the same thing, do, do, doing those letters. So how, this is what I'm telling you, as, as Bodo has just put it, how, this stress, how, how, how far can we push? Yes. So it's very important that we very quickly start the conversation of how do we bail out our, our, our institutions? Pretty much. All right, Bodo, in just two minutes, so we cross over to the next part of the conversation this morning. That is the question, Bodo. I mean, the banks are saying, well, despite what you're saying, you as the, our governor, that, well, that we look stable, you have to look for ways of cushioning us right now. You and the Treasury have to start that conversation. Bodo, what sort of regulatory response do we expect to see from the regulator and Treasury 
as regards to that? Um, well, I, I, I really expect um, one is, uh, the, 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 of course, I think Central Bank will be cognizant of the needs. Those suggestions for liquidity support, I think they'll be on standby ready to assist anybody yes. who is distressed. And I think I see that happening. Uh, uh, there was there was already an element of that last year, and also um, I think that uh, from a regulatory perspective, um, they have to look at the liquidity position of banks, right? And I think this is a wake up call for me in how you actually do what I call a liquidity measurement. They have to change how they measure liquidity. How they measure liquidity today is not very exhausting, so that should be a response, and they need to take 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 opportunity of this window and adjust it um, and the other side is uh, is the, the response which is already this is something they've done is is to ease the capital uh, the treatment of capital uh, sorry the treatment of those um, impairment adjustments on capital yes um, and you remember that in when they were t uh, when the IFRS 9 which is basically um, uh, moved transitioned impairment adjustments from uh, in card loss model to expected credit loss model. Uh, the central bank came and said, um, you know, well, because of that adoption on day one, there were some significant um, impairment adjustments that had to be passed through the balance sheets. And the, the uh, central bank gave them um, uh, an amortization uh, schedule for doing that. Um, I expect that the central bank will probably tell them, okay, look, uh, for any increased uh, impairment recognitions from, from this pandemic, don't charge your capital uh, from a prudential perspective. Because remember, the central bank is a prudential regulator. It's to apply prudence, right? So that, that's also support that I expect to come, come through. But from an accounting, accounting perspective, I expect banks to charge the capital straight. And, and, and I think um, for some of the tier two and tier three banks, um, I, I, they would have to do some capital raising next year. Yes. Pretty much, George Bodo, Abraham Udogo, thank you very much for joining us this morning to talk about exactly how the banking industry really has been faring on in the coronavirus pandemic and to put the MPC setting into proper perspective. All right, let's jump into the last issue that we have for you this morning. And this is where I'm going to introduce Boniface, Boniface Gashoka, Secretary General of Bar Hotels and Liquor Trade Association. Now, the Alcohol Beverage Association of Kenya, ABAC, has urged the National Assembly to reject a bill proposing to limit packaging of alcoholic products in containers of 750 milliliters or more. Now, the association has said in a statement that the bill will increase the consumption of illicit and unhealthy alcoholic beverages. Let's leave it there. Now, the Senate, the bill sponsored by Mundani Member of Parliament, uh, Dansona Makwana, is seeking to amend the Alcohol Bills Contract Act of 2020. 2010, sorry, to raise the minimum amount of packaged alcoholic drinks from the current 250 milliliters to 750 milliliters. All right, Mr. Gashoka, let me bring you in. You're saying the same, same thing that the bill seeks to remove is going to be counterproductive. How true is that? Uh, first of all, is uh, uh, to bring this matter of 2010 amendment issue and state the following that uh, there is no scientific backing yes. or even statistics yes or even a research that has been conducted uh, on my side and uh, for the people whom i represent we feel this is uh, using a hammer to to kill uh, an insect because uh, the whole industry is here we are easily approachable every time when an amendment wants to be done we are consulted, yes. we participate in those processes, we discuss them. But in, we, we are not yet out of the woods of COVID. I've even enjoyed to hear how the banking sector is, uh, is uh, going on uh, negatively. Yes. Now, when you look at our side, the alcohol industry, that, uh, has, uh, that we were ordered to close, and we are counting, I represent 54,000 bars in the country, and we are at a risk of closure of almost 50%. So when we start talking about increasing another cost of investment, in this case, number one, for the bar owners, they'll have to, to, to restock or to increase the cost of purchase. Because if you can afford 250, 
Now you have to pay more for you to, to, to afford a 750. For the manufacturers, they'll have to do, uh, let's say the transporters, they'll have to do amendments of their vehicles. Because those vehicles have been uh, manufactured in a way that they can only be, uh, be able to carry 250 ml and 500 ml. So they'll have to restructure. That cost is coming to almost one uh, to almost 3.14 billion for the transporters only. On the side of the manufacturers, they'll have to restructure how they're going to 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 repa to package. First of all, they'll have to refax, uh, how they're going to, to they'll have to restructure the crates. They'll have to restructure the bottles. They they'll have to restructure the content. When you go directly to our customers, if you increase the cost of consumption of a, of a piece of alcohol, a 250 ml on an estimate can go for 150. Yes. The Boda Bodas and the Mamambogas and the, the Hustlers can easily be able to afford this. We do not sell alcohol to underage. We sell to people who are responsible. And we even promote that through our CSR programs. But now when you sell the same 750 to this other person, First of all, there's a risk that these people are going to move out and look for cheap liquor. That is going to encourage illicit. That is going to encourage counterfeits. That is going to encourage illegal imports. Because when you look at our peers in the EAC, they, 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 they easily sell at 150. So that is going to bring unfair competition to us. And we're seeing all that uh, qualification of, uh, of those illegal products from Tanzania and Uganda, and even Somalia. We're seeing a lot of... Uh, uh, cheap liquor that you're going to get in. So when we do it 750, you can imagine. Beside that, we are going during COVID, the legally registered alcohol joint was closed, and that led to a lot of uh, uh, illicit getting into this country. And this is the time when we, in fact, the association is ready in partnership with ABAC and all the members to start fighting illicit. When we are putting resources to fight what is wrong. That is when somebody is increasing the packaging and the cost of illegal liquor. So that will greatly harm this economy. Besides, billions of money are going to be lost. We did a research on the impact of this proposal on the side of the bus. Right now we are talking about stock loans. If the association does not do something urgently by the end of February, we will lose 7,000 bars. If the county government will continue asking for liquor licenses and these licenses, the last day of payment is 31st of March. If we do not sit down and negotiate for something, we will lose 20,000 bars. On that uh, edge of a cliff, then we have another person who's going to increase the cost of investment in this alcohol industry. That is going to severely affect this industry. In fact, we are counting on the introduction of this bill because even that threat of the industry, these people were bleed in the cold of COVID-19 and the negative effects. On the threat of that industry, we're going to lose 3,000 bars. Just be before even we get into the integrities. So we are calling on Honorable Danson. We have a very good platform in the alcoholic industry. We are very organized people. And that is why we don't fight with the government. We engage through a conversation. We even have a business situation room that is made of ABAC, that is made of the National Bar Owners Association, that is made of a representative of the distributors and the government, and actually the, the major sectors of the government, including the cadres and the others. Let him come, we sit down and discuss, we look at the objective, what was the intended purpose, what does he want to achieve. We will help him more because we are the people who have the data, we are the people who have everything, every research that is needed, we are the people who have them. Let me add something about the bill. He's also talked about uh, packaging and uh, uh, waste disposal. In Kenya, we have enough laws on management of wastes. We have enough laws. On estimate, uh, the waste companies, the people who collect waste from us, that is recycling, they, they have a, cap a, a capital turnover of 400 million. These are figures that we have them because we are a very organized industry. In total, they do a turnover of, of 400 million. If the bill comes the way it is coming, and if it is approved, we're expecting that to reduce to 15%. I mean, that is serious. We are not yet out of the wood. We have good partners who collect for all, uh, who collect, who does waste management, or who does recycling for all our products. And we have no crisis or any problem. 
in terms of uh, recycling of alcoholic uh, products. Because the, the, the bigger boys who, who does recycling in this country, they are known. They collect properly, they recycle. And this is going to force the manufacturers of uh, alcohol, if the cost of glass will be that expensive from the introduction of a bill, it will force us to go to plastic, which to us, we feel, now it is the reintroduction of the, of the plastic manners. So we are calling on our members of parliament. We are calling on Honorable uh, Danson. We are actually praying God to have a meeting with him next week. We sit down and talk. Let's look at his, achieve, his, his objective. Let's analyze his intention. We are going to help him to achieve what he wants more. But let's not kill a whole industry or destabilize a whole alcoholic industry that is on its knees. Actually, right now, we are operating at a capacity of 37,000, 37%. That means we had an employment, an employment base of 250,000 employees. Right now we are doing 70%. So bringing another regulation, which we may call over-regulating the industry, will actually cripple this industry. Pretty much Boniface Gashoka, Secretary General, Bar Hotels and Liquor Trade Association. Thank you very much for taking your few minutes this morning to speak to Metropole Television on that contagious bill that is waiting approval in a house. Thank you so much. On that note, we come to the end of Metropole's Business M this week's edition. I'll see you next week, Monday, for another edition. Good weekend.